Welcome to Still Entitled, the Adam Savage Project. I'm Will. I'm Adam. And I'm Norm. Hello, fellow nerds. Good, oh. <laughs> good morning, beautiful nerds. <laughs> you know, after last week, I had to change my t-shirt rotation. I felt very self-conscious. Oh, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Norm, I'm Tuesday, so sorry. I had to find a, a backup t-shirt. Is it a three Death Star moon? Is that what that one it's, is? It's a balloon. They're, they're, ah. they're, um, yeah. I'm wearing a classic Gamma Go today. It's the Dirty Bird, the Hunter S. Thompson edition, which, uh, you know, I, it was my favorite of all of theirs, I think. I'm actually oh. wearing uh, one of the Express shirts that I used to wear back in Mythbuster days. I still have about 40. <laughs> I would think so, yeah. Um, the one and, of the adult shirts of single color. Well, I mean, I, I have so many black t-shirts i was i i'm doing a job in a in a few weeks an actual filming job for a client and they were like so uh you know it'd be great if you wore the same thing every day do you need us to launder your shirts every night and i'm oh like my. we're good we're good yeah. for a six-day shoot i got us covered <laughs> i i assume you just have in your closet like a, just a row of glass cases with the with the adam savage unit like the clothing unit on it right like jeans the blundstones the black t-shirt <laughs> it's a pretty i mean it's an easy uniform right yeah that's really yeah. nice that way uh how are you guys doing well, how's stuff doing pretty good uh, we've been watching some uh fun movies we watched michael clayton the other night mm. oh that's a fabulous movie um and it holds up as a hundred percent fantastic um and then wanting some more action adventure, I was deciding to re-crawl over Soderbergh's filmography uh, because that he's the kind of director that feels like Tony Gilroy to me. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And we watched The Limey last night. Oh, I've have never you, seen that. Norm, have you seen it? I've never seen it. Okay, so The Limey is one of my favorite Soderbergh films. It's a really weird film, and it's a non-standard narrative. Um, you remember, so it's the fil it came out in 99. It's the first film he made after Out of Sight, I believe. Okay. Okay. So do you remember so the love Oceans. scene? Before Ocean. So do you remember the love scene in Out of Sight? Yeah. Where they're in the hotel bar and they're chatting, but you're also seeing cuts of later on in the evening. You're, the, the film editing depicts their anticipation of the whole evening. Right. Yeah. There's. I remember there being a lot of pauses, and then it would. It would sh while the while the conversation pause is happening, you see the flash forward of, of the later in the evening. Yeah, and there's this beautiful rhythm that Soderbergh achieves with the sort of drop in of the music, the creation of those pauses, and the clips that take you out of a linear time frame. Um, well, the entirety of the limey is within that kind of cinematic headspace. Um, wow. playing, playing around with time, playing around with memory as a, and the, I think the ultimate point of the film is that it's an elegy. Uh, I won't say about what, but it stars Terrence Stamp, uh, as a just got God. out of prison, aging bank robber, uh, who's heading to LA to right a wrong. Um, and the best part is, is they have... He has flashbacks of being a young man and they actually got permission to use footage from a film from the 60s starring Terrence Stamp as a kind of a thief shitbird. It's, oh, it's insane. That. It's so cool. These cuts when you realize Julia's like the casting's amazing. And I'm like, it's actually Terrence Stamp from like 1968. Is this is a bad, I should know the answer to this, but Terrence Stamp played Zod in the first Superman. That's correct. Like Richard Donner Superman. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Um, this movie's terrific. Peter Fonda is the villain. <laughs> how, how, so I only know Peter Fonda from, from the motorcycle movie, um, Rider. uh, with Dennis Hopper. Yep. Uh, God, what's it called? Easy, uh, Easy Rider. Easy Rider. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I can't imagine him playing a villain after that. Oh, no, 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 no. He's a, he's a wonderful villain. I mean, you got to watch Once Upon a Time in the West when Henry Fonda plays one of the scariest villains in Leone's canon. Oh. Remember, Once Upon a Time in the West begins with Henry Fonda shooting a child. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Yeah. Wow. It's the big, it's the, 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 over, the shootout over the train tracks. The shootout over the train tracks. Oh, wow. Exactly. I've seen that, but I've never seen the actual movie. I'll have to go, oh. I'll have to dig that up and watch it. I when mean, you Peter watch Fonda. it, the thing about Once Upon a Time in the West, Will, is that when you watch it, you think 
that like the Western is defined by the by the by the man with the man with no name, fistful of dollars, few dollars more. Once yeah. upon a time in the West is like the icing on all of that cake. Huh? More it's than the, like Magnificent Seven and stuff like that? Oh fuck! I I think it's the best of all of those westerns. Wow. I I truly do. I love it. Love it. Love it. Okay. And it's Leone's best. It's in my opinion, it's Leone's best score. The, hmm. Oh yeah, 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 one hundred percent. The score. The way uh, all the the way all the characters' themes combine because he uses totally different orchestral sections for characters, let alone just tunes. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, and who, it's who not, got it's, the woodwinds. The, the score is by uh, what's his name? Um, Sir uh, uh, Ennio Morricone. Morricone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's time with. Um, the uh, the close up on the eyes, so he goes increasingly these these, um, yeah. these shootouts, and you have like three way you know shootouts, and it's all about the tension and anticipation, and they zoom in. He's Leone zooms in on like the, the the hands and gets closer from these wide shots, closer, tighter, tighter, tighter. So so it's all about their eyes, and I believe. I want to say I'm correct in this, in that it was scored before they film, and so the music was playing on set <gasps> when they. Filmed. Oh wow! Wow! That's amazing. Um, in this is the... one of my like I I I, I limitless things. Where yeah, like, yeah. I, I'm mm-hmm. sure I heard it once. I'm pretty sure this movie. Yeah. Well, yes, in the in the joke. in the animated flashback for Oren Ishii in Kill Bill, the yeah. one of the songs when she's hearing her parents be killed, and you hear that song. Oh. Yeah, that is one of the love themes from uh, from uh, Once Upon a Time in the West. The mm-hmm. interesting thing is when they were animating that, they actually were playing the music at the exact same time. <laughs> you know, the animators were going time, right? really, really <laughs> fast. Just that was yeah. a really fast, fast. callback, Will. Nice. I really appreciate nice. that. Like, I'll be here all <laughs> Peter week. Peter Fonda also uh, wasn't in a Western, but he was in a techno Western. He was the first human digitized for Future World. Do you remember really? That? Peter the sequel Fonda, to Westworld? It was it was in the sequel to Westworld. Oh wow! And uh, Westworld, which by the way has the first computer generated imagery of any film, which is yeah. a pixelation of mm-hmm. what the gunslinger sees. It's a, it's the blurring <laughs> his view, the terminated yeah. view, is the first digitization on screen. And so Future World had to one up that by having a uh, polygonal representation, a digitization of a oh. human in Peter Fonda's wow. visage. And and so and, and then it- of course Star Trek. Two had the first digital, all digital um, environment in that. The, that was the Genesis Planet thing, right? The Genesis yeah. Planet, right? And then there yeah. was the first generated character is uh, it's a uh, Sherlock, young Sherlock yep. Holmes. Yep, young Sherlock and, Holmes, the uh, and, the, the painted stained window, glass, the stained glass yes. window. Night. We've all seen the same island documentaries. <laughs> wow, wow. Um, uh, hold on, you missed the John Knoll uh, animation in Star Wars. The uh, you know the little. The the this is the Death Star the zoom in like the the dot the dot oh. representation was CG, right right. Um, oh yes. Um, and and by the way, Peter Fonda has been in many westerns, including Three Ten to Yuma, oh. uh, with Russell Crowe, who has acted with all of the Fondas. He was with Bridget Fonda in a movie called Rough Magic. Uh, Early, okay. early Russell Crowe film, and then he was with Jane Fonda in something more recently in the last like ten years, but I can't remember what. Well, you mentioned um, Jean Dol, and I wanted to to segue quickly. The Mandalorian yeah. uh, gallery behind the scenes, Disney Gallery behind the scenes series wrapped up this past weekend. Eighth oh, episode. it did. Ooh, and, and the eighth episode might be my favorite because it's called Connections. It's all about the hidden Easter eggs and stories about the making. And and so you hear things like Mark Hamill voiced a robot, a droid. Inside. I heard about that, yeah. the bartender, right? On, on Tatooine. And like the thing that I didn't even realize is that's the bar in Tatooine that Luke goes to and the droid is a bartender. And remember the bartender in episode four says, we don't no take droids. Kind, no droids yeah. here, none of their kind here. And yet years later and after, you know, the fall of the empire, the droids run and maybe in their head oh. in the bar. Uh, yeah. But the John Knoll story is they did a whole roundtable and John Knoll was talking about cameos and visual effects. And I didn't know this, but uh, when they did the special edition remasters, yeah. in the X-Wing scene, you know, one of the big uh, hero shots that they remastered was the, uh, the squadron of X-Wings descending on the Death Star in episode yeah. four toward the end. That was a big yeah. remastered scene they did. I remember uh, John that. Knoll is the head. It's his face in all the X-Wings. <laughs> he is every X-Wing pilot there. That, that is 
That is, membership has its privileges, That's right? That's good, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, we only have budget to scan one ad. Who's it going to be? And, and then apparently, this guy right here. Uh, like, they, they, you know, as uh, as Favreau says, they use every part of the Buffalo in that production. This is TV budgets. <laughs> right. Uh, they had cameos. The episode that Bill Burr uh, was in, yep. where uh-huh. the heist film, and the X-Wings come in, the squadron comes in. Those yeah. three X-Wing pilots are three of the directors of uh, The Mandalorian. It's oh, Dave nice. Lee, uh, Deborah Chow and Rick Fugima. And oh, that's awesome. They filmed them inside. They were very reluctant to apparently do those shots because they're directors, not actors. And so yeah. Dave Lee does this whole bit about how he's being called on set and he's really trying to get out of being this X-Wing pilot. It's a dream job for any- right. You know, one participating yeah. in Star Wars to be a pilot in Star Wars, but he's trying to get out of it. And Favreau's like, I'm never going to let, let you live it down if you don't do this. And so he realizes how painful it is for actors, for everyone to wait on them after wardrobe, after makeup, right? Walk into this room where it's like dozens of crew waiting for you. Spotlights just on you. And John Favreau's like feeding him lines while he's singing this X-wing pilot. And so while it's supposed to be this glorious moment. It's just really awkward for him, and it gives him more empathy as a director to work with actors. Um, and the cockpit, apparently, they took from the, the theme parks. They took the oh, X-Men wow. Florida at Galaxy's Edge, brought wow. it to where they were filming, and then dressed it to, to work amazing. as an actual cockpit. Wow. Ah. Yeah. That's, That's amazing. Um, uh, I'll think I can watch the rest of those. That sounds good. <laughs> This isn't a segue so much, but I wanted to do a brief in memoriam. We lost two amazing people in the last week. We lost Ian Holm and Joel Schumacher. Yeah. It's, Ian Holm was one of those actors that he's been everything. He's like, you can't pinpoint one iconic role. And maybe it's for, it's a like cross-generational. I, yep. I, look, for, for me... The first time I realized who Ian Holm was probably was watching the uh, the Lord of the Rings, right? Like oh the, wow! The that because because so I'm bad at character actors often, and I think right. I think it's fair to put him in that category, right? Totally. Um. So so like it's you know you see the familiar face, but then there's this there's this this character that has a really crucial early role that sets a lot right. of the tone for the rest of that movie, and and that's that's where. I was like, oh, this guy's really good. I've seen him before. I wonder where, what he was. You know, he is one of those actors that I throw on the list with Don Cheadle and Gene Hackman and Aaron Eckhart that if they're in a movie, that movie's better because they're there. Peter Stormare, yeah. William yep. Fickner, these are very yep. old actors. Men. They're like, they're so versatile and yeah. they add a presence to a film. And and they and they and they they're real they're real craftspeople, right? They you you're always like Oh, that's Ian Holm. You're always doing that, right? Yeah. Um, I love him in Alien. We just watched that the other night. My mom hadn't seen it since 1979. Wait, he's is he the is he the android? Yes. Oh, holy Holm shit! Is, <laughs> I mean, he's very young. Just like John Hurt was extremely young as Kane. Uh, yeah. yeah. He's also he's also wow. he's also Jonathan Price's boss in Brazil. Yes. Has anybody oh, yeah. okay. seen Sam Lowry? Yeah, that that one I can see. That one, that, there's a through line there from from there to Bilbo. I think. Uh, um, am I? Uh, he's in a couple of those Merchant Ivory films, but I also get him confused sometimes with Anthony. Um, what's his name? Uh, Silence of the Lambs. Hopkins. 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 Thank you. Um, Ian Holm, man, uh, you know, watching him in Alien again makes it really clear how incredible that ensemble was and really how impressive his performance is. Um, his annoyance at Ripley from the very first moment he meets her, he makes a ton of meat out of some very small lines, you know? Yeah, um, his, it's his kind of passive aggressive, like, you know, good luck, but you're, you're not gonna survive after yeah. he's just ahead on the table, yeah. like your odds of survival, not good. Like that resignation, it's it's the definitive android Dude. Uh, role that, uh, performance that then, yeah. you know, that was adapted on in Prometheus and, and all the alien films uh, forth. The the thing that is so hard, like the, th- my, my, so I saw Aliens <laughs> first and then I saw Alien. So I knew, like I didn't go into Alien knowing 
the the twist you know the twist right, which right, is the, right. the woman that nobody had ever heard of before and it was her first role is the is is survives the haunted house right right and right. i i like if i ever get whacked on the head hard enough to not remember anything please take me to see alien that's my request it's just so, don't tell me yeah. anything <laughs> let me let me know who the famous people are and and then yeah, you know yeah. just watch what happens i i would love to go into that movie called yeah um, I, what's funny is my mom was like, oh, I'd really like to watch that. And I, I have literally watched it as recently as two and a half months ago. And yeah. every time I see it, I feel like I'm seeing a new movie. I'm noticing things I never noticed before. I'm catching bits and pieces that are just really incredible. We, we watched, um, Lebowski while we were playing board games. Oh, wow. Weekend. And it, it, it's probably been five or 10 years since I saw it last. And every single time, like trying to unpack what the characters know, and it's, it's the same thing with Alien, trying right. to unpack what the characters know about what's going on at any given moment in either of those films is a real challenge. Um, um, we also got to talk about Ian Home and Fifth Element. Oh, of course. Oh, yes, right. yes, yes, right. Yeah, that's, that's um, what, that, grown up, that's the one I associate him with. Before yes, he was the archaeologist, right? The, the he, flash, he flashback? Priest. He's no, the yeah. priest. He's yeah, yeah, yeah. The priest. Oh, oh, right, right, right. <laughs> right, yeah. the holder of the key, yeah, yeah. right? Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> he has, um, he's, the, the comedy in that performance is so good. Yeah. yeah. The, the physical comedy. Um, and, like, while we're talking about comedy, I think it's important if we're going to talk about Joel Schumacher that we immediately get past Batman's nipples. Yes. Look, when you go back and... So... T taking over Batman from Tim Burton, you know, af after Tim Burton like got a bazillion dollars to make Edward Scissorhands or whatever and moved on to make, so, so he would do Batman Returns, taking over a dark gritty version of Batman. I think Batman Forever is okay. I, I, I like Batman Forever. It's like, it's like a flashback to the 60s Batman. It's, it's all campy and bright and colorful and fun and silly and goofy and yeah, all I, the things I, that the Tim I, Burton one wasn't. I get that. I just can't watch it. But I also yeah. like. I also like. Schumacher's two Batman films are famous. There are a lot of what gets talked about when he gets brought up, and he's so much deeper and more important of a filmmaker than those two yeah. films. I, and I, what, and the, what, oh, just by the way, one thing I love is that uh, right after the second Batman film, Schumacher decided to go back to his roots and shoot a low-budget film with a then unknown actor named Colin Farrell. I was going to, yeah. Uh, and the movie is called Tigerland. And if you haven't seen it, it's incredible. And Farrell is rightfully, uh, it, it made, the film uh, made him a star and rightfully so. He's incendiary in it and really incredible. And it's a an beautiful and sensitively made Vietnam era film uh, that's really worth seeing. And Schumacher was on Terry Gross after Tigerland came out. and she was saying, what was it like to go back to this? And he said, you know, after the second Batman film, someone, someone put on social media that I needed a good smack in the head. He said, and I agree with them. He said, no one has any idea what it's like to helm a franchise where you're talking to the toy companies and the studios and the every mar merchandising and marketing yeah, and all that. McDonald's tie-in products. Yeah. Like he the said, whole thing. Oh, oh, hold on. I lost my headphones. Anyway, he said... He lost his mind and that totally happened. And, you know, I, I appreciated him for being super honest about that. I've always loved that he like was humorously honest about that. And uh, he the reset his career right after that because he was put in Hollywood jail and then Tigerland. And I think of Colin Farrell going like that was the massive ascent of Colin Farrell because he did that and then like Minority Report right after. And then right. he was well, everywhere. And, then Daredevil and Phone Booth. Phone Booth was the, the other one that he did with Colin Farrell. Yeah. That's which right. is a spectacular movie. And yes. Schumacher also did Falling Down with Michael Douglas, which is right. a super dark and amazing film. Yes. Yeah, it's it's like if you when you it's funny cuz you go through the filmography and it's kind of like um like you have to imagine that Danny Boyle took a cue from him, right? Cuz like Schumacher didn't do a whole lot of different like he didn't do the same genre very often. No, he, he did Saint Almost Fire, he made The Lost Boys, the which Lost is my Boys. favorite vampire movie. Uh, Flatliners, which like was the, <laughs> like, 
I, I like I was in high school when that came out. I think I saw it three times in the theaters because it's such a weird movie and I didn't like you didn't know what was going on. It's such a weird movie where is death a hockey player? Is that how that works? I feel like if the death is the <laughs> hockey player and like they, <laughs> they that it's the movie where they keep killing themselves to see what's on yeah. the other side of the veil, right? It's also yeah. I think it's Oliver Platt's first movie or an mm. early Oliver Platt movie. Oliver Platt's another actor who like Jeffrey Wright and uh, uh, like we were talking, Ian Holm, uh, one of those great actors that makes everything they're in better. Let's yeah. also remember there are great uh, character actors who are women. Like Absolutely. Allison Janney. Oh, oh, of course. Um, oh. Uh, 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 Regina King. You know, Judy Greer, who's in everything. Judy yeah. Greer, yep. I don't yeah. know who I know you from. Her wonderful book about that. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know where you know me from. Yeah. Um, um, Judy, he, yeah. He uh, Schumacher also did a couple of John Grisham adaptations that were uh, like the client. I don't know. I, I never saw that, but a time to kill is, is right up there with like the great Southern lawyer movies. The client's um, wonderful. That's Susan Sarandon and the kid, right? It, yeah. It's, it's yeah. about the de Wait, is that not the death row one? No, that's the, that's Susan Sarandon. That's another Susan Sarandon. That, that's that's dead man movie. walking. Tim dead Robbins walking. directed yeah. that with Sean yeah, yeah. Penn. Um, um, yeah, the client's terrific, and a time to kill with Matt with the early McConaughey as and Sam, Sam Jackson. Jackson. Yeah, yeah, Sa Sam Jackson in like a, a serious drama role when you were kind of used to seeing him in 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 you know getting his arm chewed off in Jurassic Park or something. And and Oliver Platt again. Oliver Platt, I think, is also in that he plays one of uh, uh, McConaughey's co counsels. Yeah, is that Sandra <laughs> um, Bullock? Is she also in that? I. Uh, you know what? I'm, I'm, really <laughs> really I'm going ourselves. off the IMDb in my head. Yes. Um, Schumacher, yeah. So yeah, Sandra let's take Bullock, Schumacher. Yeah. I think it's time Schumacher came out of Batman jail culturally. And 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 I hope that I, I'm sad that he has passed. Uh, and he's contributed a lot to our culture, way more than just Batman. Absolutely. Um, I would say 12, which came out a few years ago, is worth watching. It's 10 years old now, I guess. 12? 12 yeah it's about a drug dealer and oh. he's he's like it's it's a crime tragedy tragedy it's 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 very it was based on a novel i believe i don't know about it it's a it was like it was uh probably you're probably too old it was pushed probably toward a young adult crowd at that <laughs> point like a pg-13 crowd and it has like rory culkin and and then a bunch and a bunch of other people uh zoe Macaulay Kravitz culkin it. you mean no rory culkin macaulay's oh brother niece or nephew or something oh there's more than R macaulay and kieran there's multiple <laughs> culkins wow there's there's more there's Culk there's this as is, many culkins as our cats apparently he is the brother of shane culkin dakota culkin macaulay culkin kieran culkin quinn culkin and christian culkin there wow. are one two three four five seven culkins it sounds so like you're you making go. up culkins i i look i might the mother <laughs> truth this might have been fake <laughs> one of those names was wrong you know, I've been, I, I over the weekend started uh, what just came out, which is Perry Mason. Mm. And oh, the new one. Uh, yes. Uh, on Hubbo. I, it's on HBO. Yes. Uh, I'm an unabashed fan of the original Perry Masons. I love watching those. They were like on rerun all the time on television growing up. Yeah. And it was like yeah, the constantly. archetype of the television courtroom. Yep. drama and procedural and this is not that it's very much a boardwalk empire s you know miniseries it's almost like boardwalk empire true detective crossover it's matthew and it, really playing it, perry mason i was said it's, it's set in like the 30s right set in the early 30s right i think 31 to 32 and really funny if you're like like we see a lot of you know stuff out of the 20s we obviously see a lot of stuff out of the 40s but having recently been on a like 30s movie kick with like a you know, Cary Grant movies. Uh, mm -hmm. It's wonderful to see that era Los yeah. Angeles portrayed. And they have their analogs, the big studios. They have, you know, their, their fatty Arbuckle analog in, in a character. And, and, and uh, Matthew Reese is always great. And then also and he's has always uh, great. Shea Wiggum, who's uh who played Eli, the brother in Boardwalk Empire. And he's another one of those character ah. actors that I, I love. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Amazing. So I recommend that Perry Mason. Excellent. I will. Um, uh, we'll take a look at it. Yeah. <laughs> look at this. My phone now says potential spam. Oh. Congratulations. <laughs> what uh, what projects have you been working on, Adam? Anything you can talk about? Any any uh, 
I, uh, uh, well, as I've been wearing an apron more and more, I'm st I, I have formed several significant points of view on aprons, and I'm about to execute some of those point of views. Ooh. Let's just put it that way. Um, novel materials, Adam? You know what? Actually, I, uh, speaking of novel materials, uh, no, not too many exotic materials for that one, but there's a material that I used to use back in the early days of my prop construction in the 90s that was made by Owens Corning, and it was a pink foam, and they used to do commercials for it, starring the Pink Panther. Yeah, I remember and that stuff. The, uh, uh, Owens Corning makes all sorts of that pink foam insulation, um, but this was a rigid foam that came two inches thick, two feet wide, and about six or eight feet long. And that used to be sold at every hardware store, and I it was for to... putting in between your rafters in the attic, right? Exactly. Put it under and, the subfloor. Yeah. And I, I used that stuff endlessly in the 90s for theater props and film props and sets and all sorts of stuff. And I wanted to, I've been wanting to do a one-day build with it for a while. And I went out recently to the lumber yard to find out that not only does nobody sell it anymore except for Home Despot, but that Home that they don't even make it in the two inch thick anymore and it's way more expensive than it used to be. So I ended up buying oh, it, boy. but I paid way too much money for it for this, for this one day build I did. And I'm hoping that people online could point me towards other potential products that are similar. Cause I don't <laughs> like the thing about foam construction is it's incredibly easy and usually really cheap because foam's cheap, but the white bead foam, the expanded polystyrene foam, it's just too rough as a, um, it gets everywhere. Yeah. It's lighter than air. It's affected by static. You end up covered in it. Everything in your life ends up covered in it. And I, I don't love it if, unless you have tons of uh, dust uh, mitigation. Uh, and the Dow foam was much better on that front. So uh, I, I, I bought a bunch. It was one inch thick. I had to laminate a ton. Uh, <laughs> and it, the build worked out great. But uh, I was sad that the material that I had counted on for so long was no longer. Oh. Yeah. Um, speaking of materials, I'm uh, doing a lot of laser cutting, and I'm loving acrylic more and more. Uh, yeah. For two yeah. reasons. And I'm looking for a place, and maybe this is a call out there, I, I need to find a place to get cheap, like, eighth-inch acrylic cut to size that I can laser cut with. Because it's not cheap. But yeah. I, the reason I love it is, one um, – I use a filter and it does not like the, the fumes from acrylic don't wear out your filter ah. as, as quickly as, you know, cardboard smoke or, and wood. Uh, yeah. Right, right, right. Like, all your HEPA filters just clog up real quickly. So you can you get longer life from that. And then also it works so quick because of what you, something you showed me years ago, which is acrylic cement. And I don't yeah. think that's used enough. Acrylic cement is works fast. It's, it, it's like super glue. Yeah. And it, and, and, I don't think you even get it on Amazon. Tap sells it. Yeah, you can. But a little bit goes so far. Yeah, yeah. And it just stays bonded forever. It's a weld yeah. bond because it melts both sides of the equation. Um, the trick is, yeah, uh, sometimes you have to tune your laser cutter so that edge isn't too bumpy. Mm -hmm. If it's a pulse, if it's a pulse uh, uh, cut, sometimes on some cutters it can be rough on that front. But yeah, uh, I love, uh, one of my things at ILM was being able to, laser cut something in one pass that it tabbed and slotted together with enough precision that you just needed to drop like drop, four yeah. lines of the weld bond glue and it would sock the whole thing together. Yeah. With the capillary effect. And it, yeah. yeah. What, what are you, um, Norm, are you doing, what, what are you doing when you need more rigidity than the one eighth will do? Are you just gluing two sheets, cutting two sheets and gluing them together? Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I don't want cut. It's, <clears throat> So much of a hassle to try to cut something thicker on a laser, at least a home home size. One takes forever. That I have, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's real slow. Lots of fumes. Yeah, uh, eighth is where I'm comfortable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Oh, um, well, good check and yeah. watch a Joel Schumacher movie, folks. Yeah. Yeah. Tight. You could do worse than Tigerland, but there's a whole bunch of wonderful films, and uh, many of them have super high ratings on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, falling down is a masterpiece. Michael Douglas, a wonderful it's, Michael Douglas film. It's a little hard to watch. Like it's, uh, it's, it might be it's, much harder to watch these days. Yeah, the the, the yeah probably <laughs> yeah, yeah the Michael Douglas character is problematic probably in a way. Oh, now he's that super problematic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, he's the hero. He's a villain both at the yeah. same time. Yeah, yeah. Joke. Um, that's what we're talking about. 
Mm-hmm. Lovely to catch up with you guys. Yeah, it's good to see you guys. See um, Adam. So, and yeah. We'll, wait, what's on the site, Norm? Uh, we got more one-day builds. Uh, what's coming up this week? Ah, Adam, I didn't know what this was, but you make a stitching pony. Yes. And uh, it came together. It's one of those builds that you did like in half a day. I think you knew exactly what you wanted to do. I've been thinking about it and sketching it, it for a while. Yeah. Um, What's this a stitching a, pony? Uh, well, it's, this is inspired. A stitching pony is what a leather worker would use for holding on to something like a, uh, there, something that they're sewing, right? Okay. So for leather work, you punch holes and then you line them up and then you sew them together, but you often need a third hand. And a stitching pony is a leather worker's clamp for that. Um, Chris at ClickSpring uses a modified stitching pony to hold the parts while he's firing them, filing them. And since I've been doing a lot more precise filing of parts, I decided to make one using the same techniques that he does, up to and including using an equivalent to pitch to hold my leather onto the jaws of the, uh, of the stitching pony. It was a really interesting Ooh, experience. That's exciting. Yeah. It's a, it's a really fascinating looking <laughs> apparatus. And, yeah. yeah. It's come in so much handy, man. I'm using it all the time. But the extra set of hands is always useful, it turns out. Exactly, yeah. This week... Go ahead, Norm. I was just going to say, this week on the Tech Pod, uh, we talked about uh, tech mess-ups, mistakes. I I think I told you the story about how I almost got electrocuted um, fixing computers when I was doing IT work before I started as a journalist. Um, but we went down a big list of those and, uh, we, more importantly, we asked for people to submit their own, uh, tech horror stories and we'll read the best. We've gotten a bunch of really good ones, but I'd love more from the audience. Like, like your, your mistakes that lit things on fire or made the magic smoke come out of the computer or, you you can't release the mysterious blue smoke. No, no. That's what makes everything go. It turns out. Yeah, totally. And, and you can find that at techpod.content.town. Awesome. It's good to see you both. Uh, Adam, yeah. let us know what movie you're going to watch later this week, potentially, and then we'll maybe find the time to do a, a spoiler cast of some kind. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll do. Yeah, that sounds good. All right, All gentlemen. Right. Bye, Have guys. Have a lovely week. Bye. Bye. Bye.